Thank you. I think we've probably got uh, around about a quorum, so let's begin. Um, a heads up and reminder first that we are recording the meeting. We'll make the, the video and slides available on the meeting webpage at uh, www.nurse.gov sort of shortly afterwards. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll follow our normal format, which I think people are, are fairly familiar with now. Um, the idea of this is to be an interactive meeting, um, which is to say, please participate. Uh, you can you can either raise a hand or or just unmute yourself and, and speak up when you've got a, a question or a comment to make. There'll be lots of opportunities for that. And I think we're, you know, we're, we've got around about 20 people at the moment. So that's a, a comfortable enough uh, size, I think, that we can just speak up. Uh, we also have, if you're not already part of it, the nurse user Slack. Uh, I'll paste a link to that in the Zoom chat. Yep. Wrong chat, that was the Slack chat. Um, so that's a, a good place to uh, yeah, to post comments and to sort of continue the conversation. Uh, and we, we tend to use the webinars channel just to keep it as a, a separate place from the general channel. Yeah, but either is good. If you're not part of Slack already, you know, it's a, a great um, forum for you know, swapping ideas and communicating with other users and yeah, giving heads up about uh, yeah, something doesn't seem to be working, or asking questions about how to do things. So our agenda will follow kind of our normal pattern. So we'll start out with a, a win of the month and that's the flip side of uh, today I learned. We've got a few announcements to make and there's uh, yeah, opportunity to yeah, for participants to make announcements there too. And then for our topic of the day, we have uh, Norm Barassa from NERSC's Building Infrastructure Group who's a uh, energy efficiency expert and has uh, yeah, uh, done a lot around uh, NERSC's setup for energy efficiency with, uh, with its computer room. So he'll uh, talk us through a you know, a little bit about some of the things that we're doing and have an opportunity for discussion there. Uh, and then we'll finish up with uh, some you know, looking ahead to what's coming up and a quick run through our numbers last, last month. So starting out for uh, win of the month. So the aim of this segment is to, you know, basically share and, uh, and celebrate the achievements in our community. Um, and they can be big or small, yeah, getting a paper accepted, solving a challenging bug. Um, yeah, especially it might be something that's uh, you know, worthy of nomination as a, a candidate for a, uh, a science highlight or a high impact scientific achievement award or in, in the innovative use of high performance computing award. Um, yeah, has anybody got uh, something they'd like to share? Something new and interesting? On NERSC's side, I'm pretty sure this happened since our last uh, gathering with the uh, ISC June top 500 list came out. And uh, Perlmutter came in at number five, which is the, the same point at which uh, Corey debuted, actually, so number five on the list. So uh, I know a lot of people put a lot of effort into uh, getting the, yeah, the system up and ready and you know, running the, the benchmarks for that. A bit of a quiet month. We can uh, step along to and, and maybe also combine with. Uh, so, so the flip side of that is today I learned. Um, yeah, of course it's great when something works, 
but a lot of the path to getting something working is finding a lot of things that didn't work first. Uh, and so this is kind of an opportunity to uh, yeah, swap ideas and notes and share stories about things that were things that were difficult, uh, things we got stuck on, uh, dead ends that we hit, things that seem like they ought to work but didn't. Uh, and yeah, the, the idea here is that you know, what yeah, we can learn from from each other we can, uh, and and you know, bounce ideas off each other of how to how to solve things as well. Uh, it's also kind of an opportunity to talk about a, you know, a new tip for using NERSC systems that you might have come across recently or just something interesting that you learned or read recently that might interest others. Been a, a very quiet month by the sounds of it. So now for me, a lot of the, uh, the learning in the last month has been uh, uh, experiences using SPAC, uh, using SPAC to set up a, a bunch of uh, software environment, uh, which, which we have both on uh, Corey as well as you know, setting up Perlmutter. And uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, powerful tool. Uh, it does a, a lot of clever things. Uh, it could also be, a, yeah, there, there can be some challenges um, yeah, working out what didn't work when a, when a build failed. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, an interesting experience sort of you know, diving in and uh, looking at how it, uh, you know, how it does things. Uh, but uh, something that's been really helpful there is the community on, on Slack. So if you're, if you're using it to install software, there's a, a spec Slack, which has quite a, a helpful group of uh, users. Sounds like we have, uh, we have a, a quiet session for today. Maybe we'll step forward to the next one then of some announcements and CFP. So we, we definitely have a few from the NERSC side here. Um, so the ones that I have listed here uh, have more detail in the last weekly emails. So you can go back and check that for links to things and so on. Uh, important things that might, that, yeah, that well <laughs> that will affect people. Um, in the latest uh, maintenance, we updated Slurm, and there is a, a slight change in Slurm's behavior, which is a, a dash dash overlap flag for when you're running multiple S runs on the same node. So most kind of typical, you know, straightforward use isn't impacted by this. The, the most common use case, of course, is yeah. S run dash n mini nodes dash little n mini tasks my executable, uh, but there is a uh, you know reasonably useful uh, use case where sometimes you want to run multiple programs on the same node. So you you're starting one S run on on half of the CPUs, for instance, and another S run on the other half of the CPUs either as part of a, a workflow or two things that are working together. And for those, it used to be a, a fairly simple, you know, do one S run, put it into the background, do the other S run, put it into the background, wait for them all. Uh, you now need to let Slurm know that it, it's allowed to start S runs on the same node. And so there's a, a new dash dash overlap flag for that. So we have some examples in our docs of how to use that. And here's just a, kind of a, a short form of what's, what's changed there. Other important um, announcement 
is we have a, a Core OS update planned for September. It's a minor update, uh, but we will be changing the PE, which is the programming environment, which is kind of the, the default set of modules that you get when you uh, log in. Uh, and one expected impact of this is that statically linked things will need to be relinked. So dynamically linked things should be fine because again, dynamic linking, they'll uh, you know, get linked at load time to the you know, appropriate updated version of a library. But for statically linked things, uh, some things might have changed in some of the underlying libraries that you know, if they're now statically linked in, yes, some APIs can change. So, so just a heads up, in September, you probably will need to relink, not, not necessarily rebuild, although that's sometimes the most straightforward way of doing it, but at least relink the any statically linked executables that you're using. Um, some CFPs coming up there uh, that we know about, the links to these are in the weekly email. There's a, a workshop on accelerated programming using directives, a parallel applications workshop for alternatives to MPI plus X. I think this covers things like uh, yeah, GasNet and uh, uh, yeah, Global Array sort of stuff. Uh, also, um, and also at um, SC21 is the Super Check workshop on checkpointing. Uh, a few training things coming up, the ECP, ideas webinar series. If you haven't seen this, this is there's some really interesting stuff there and, and some good sort of yeah, little tips for using HPC and for, for scientific computing. And after the webinars are complete, they uh, upload links to the recordings onto the website. So uh, I think links to the website are in the weekly email. Uh, take a look and go there. So the next one coming up is on uh, multi-institutional scientific software development and some you know, lessons learned and best practices and so on. And that's in August. Uh, we have uh, tomorrow, I believe, there's a, a training hosted by NVIDIA, I think, uh, about uh, CUDA multi-threading multi with streams. This is useful for uh, preparing for um, Perlmutter. Uh, there's also in about another month in late August, uh, a four day CMake training where we're partnering with Qware. So if you uh, develop or even just sort of you build an install application that could be uh, well worthwhile. And uh, one other kind of interesting announcement that we have, uh, if you haven't seen it already, the E4S, which is the X Dream scale scientific software stack, I think, um, which is part of the ECP project, is updated uh, version 21.2, just to say February, um, February 2021, is now available on Cori. Uh, I think everything's built for uh, Cori Haswell. It may or may not be available for uh, KNL. As yet, but you can uh, you know, use the, the specs there as a starting point for that. Um, it's quite a thorough set of packages and libraries. So, yeah, ADOS, HDF5, um, I think Petsy might be part of it, Slepsy, so on. So, so there's some sort of good libraries available there. Uh, to get it, it's sort of a two step process, you'll need to module load E4S stack first and that will put other modules in your path with the specific packages it also sets up a, a spec environment for building things on top of it that's the announcements that uh, i have from nurse side does anybody have any other uh calls for participation that they'd like to bring up or announce Yeah, we're uh, racing through today's meeting. Normally, normally we don't arrive here for another uh, 10 minutes, but I think I saw that <laughs> Norm is on. Yeah, yeah um, I'm here. I thought you said this was a chatty group. Yeah, normally normally it is a chatty group. But it's, uh, yeah, everyone, right here I am. We, we, we haven't had enough coffee yet this morning or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, would you like to share a screen and? Yeah, uh, I've yeah. like you, like you suggested. I've uh, condensed my slide deck that you had seen, but it looks like I'm going to have generous time. So maybe maybe I should go to the yeah. big extended. I've some uh, time to you know, bounce through <laughs> bounce through additional topics. Well, yeah, we can go below the fold. I kept the other slides um, in there for below the fold if needed. Um, here we go. Oh, hang on a sec here. I got to share. So by way of introduction, maybe. Norm's yeah, part of the uh, building infrastructure group and he's done a lot of work around energy efficiency. And uh, yeah, so he's, so he's got some, uh, yeah, some quite interesting stories and, and clever tricks and well, tricks might not might not be the right word, but uh, you know, uh, oh, yes. approaches that uh, it's all most users mirrors. to improve its uh, energy efficiency. So uh, I, I will say I, I tried to find that Slack um, channel webinars, but I, I didn't see it. So if uh -huh. any questions end up coming through there, I'll have to rely on you to. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll watch that, that and report back on. So, so um uh as yeah i said i my name is norm barasa um a little word on my history i've been an employee at at uh, lawrence berkeley national lab since uh, 2000 so 21 years now i initially came to uh, lawrence berkeley lab after having a, a uh, worked in an area called energy engineering and energy efficiency for commercial buildings for five years in California. Uh, I graduated from Cal on the architecture program, which merged with the previous uh, electronics engineering degree that I have. And I got dovetailed into the energy efficiency world of commercial buildings in California in the late 1990s, and culminating with uh, joining uh, Berkeley Lab and researching building science and energy efficiency for uh, commercial buildings. And um, 2017, in the wake of us uh, coming to the new CRT building now called Shai Wang Hall here on campus, um, I joined NERSC at 50% time in 2017 to help with the energy efficiency and energy performance of the building. I'll go over those reasons later. And um, in early 2019, just before the pandemic transitioned to, well, actually before that, it was 100% time, but I transitioned fully over to the division and now focus uh, my time on, on making sure that the building performs well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go over with the reasons for some of that later, but I wanna just talk first about something that uh, all of the, the users here in, in our community are probably pretty well aware. The, the first level of an energy improvement just goes down to the processing capability of these uh, scientific computing platforms. And this is some, an aspect of the generational improvements of our systems that, that users may not have appreciated. But if you look, you know, let's just go as far back only as 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 Edison. If you if you look at the at its uh, power consumption for its compute throughput, when we deployed Cori, we got roughly five Edisons with really a doubling of the power. So if you think of that, this is Moore's you know law stuff, but that's energy efficiency right there. That computational throughput for less power consumption is, is energy efficiency at the first order. And we're getting the same thing with Perlmutter. We only, we're getting less than a doubling in power, but a three times uh, improvement. That's at the design level. Actually, after the HPL runs, we now know we're actually getting more of a performance improvement than, than this. And I don't know exactly what the full numbers are. So it's important to lose track of that. But one thing that you will notice, we are getting a doubling of power, but a five times improvement. And it's going to come in slightly under five times. So we can see the softening of the Moore's law. And we're looking at Oh, believe it or not, we're actually looking at Nurse 10 
Um, and, and it looks like there'll even be more of a softening of that. But this, but this is an important aspect. Our, our, our computational technology is providing core uh, energy efficiency improvement. That's not to negate the need to make sure that these infrastructure um, and other support aspects of our operational uh, uh, services don't um, need to be paid attention to. So I've, I've got three basic levels of energy efficiency at the support and the infrastructure level that I want to point out. Um, the, the next level that I always like to emphasize is once you start a compute job, it should complete. Because if it doesn't complete, if it gets to 70%, gets to 30%, or gets even before it gets to 100% and it crashes, that's just pure waste out the window. And this is one of the reasons why we put so much emphasis in helping our users with their, car, their code. And, and we do the best we can to ensure that once jobs are being deployed, they have a high probability of succeeding. Um, then site-specific facility design is next. Nurse, we are located here in Berkeley and we happen to have a very mild climate and we're able to produce um, a, an HVAC system that doesn't use chillers, basically vapor compression, uh, air conditioning, which we're all very familiar with. Oh, the light's turned off on me. I'm the only one on the floor right here. Um, so uh, uh, this is an important aspect of being able to just dissipate the heat to the environment without very energy intensive HVAC equipment. I'll talk about that later. And then the last thing is once you have that equipment deployed, having high resolution monitoring tools and data analysis tools to, to adequately, adequately determine whether the, the, those systems are performing optimally is a, a perennial challenge. And NERSC has invested a lot in both in staff and, infra and, and systems deployment to, to be able to, uh, uh, to monitor how our systems are performing, analyze and, and improve them, this, this, this positive feedback loop. And indeed, we're, we're helping to set the standard um, uh, for the state of the art in scientific computing. A quick, quick words on our building. Uh, we're a four story, 150,000 square foot building. Uh, and um, basically 40K of that is offices. So we don't count that in our efficiency metrics. Uh, we basically have a, a power supply uh, capability of 21 and a half megawatts, which is usually uh, about double what our expected uh, draw is and our two systems, Perlmutter and Corey, are capable of, of drawing a peak of 10 megawatts. Uh, as I said, we're year-round compressor free air uh, and water cooling systems. We're lead gold rated. We have an annual uh, average PUE of 108. I'll talk about that uh, further. Um, most of the time we just use outside air, condition it, you know, cool it down, goes through the, uh, the computer room and then just exhaust out. And that's, that's speaking uh, to the, to the um, a very mild climate that we have for most hours of the year in California, um, right, or in, in Berkeley. Uh, right now, NERSC or Shai Wang Hall is approximately 40% of the campus energy demand. So we are basically designated here uh, as the significant energy user uh, on, on the Berkeley lab campus. So that gives us a lot of extra attention and help from the lab directorate in identifying energy efficiency measures. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, for, we've received lots of recognition in the, de the Department of Energy circle uh, at the head office and in the various uh, uh, programs there uh, for our multidisciplinary approach to maintaining energy efficiency uh, in the building. Uh, we collaborate. Uh, if, um, deeply with my former division, the energy technologies area, 
uh, where there is a data center's efficiency center for general IT for the for the private sector, and they uh, their experts come in and help me. We also have a, a, a specialist energy engineering consultant called KW Engineering. This gentleman right here that that comes in and and does consulting for all of the buildings on campus and has got a special attention for for nurse because of our high energy demand. Um, what are the targets that we use to know that we are actually operating efficiently? We have two metrics. We have the power usage effectiveness. And, and a subset of it, which is IT power usage effectiveness. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, basically, PUE is the facility wide. Um, that's where you have the total center energy divided by the compute energy. So you, you basically end up with um, uh, uh, um, uh, facility overhead. So for example, if uh, the compute energy is say six megawatts, and our total facility is uh, 6.8 megawatts. That 0.8 represents the, the, you know, the 08 part, which is an 8% facility overhead. That's how much electricity that we consume for all of the services over and above the compute. Uh, IT eliminates some of the, of the you know, non support stuff that doesn't matter as much and looks just in at the IT um, inside the cabinet and peels out the HVAC. And, and it's, it's a way of understanding the efficiency of the HVC directly. Another one that's becoming much more important is wattage, water usage effectiveness. That is um, uh, our cooling, our water cooling facilities use these large cooling towers, which uh, you can see a picture of down here. We've got seven of them and they evaporate a lot of water during the year. And here in California, as you all may know, there is uh, a lot of, uh, a lot more importance in water efficiency. Currently with Perlmutter, we're projected to evaporate somewhere around 60 million gallons of water a year. So it's a, a lot of water. That was a large increase from the Cori only or the, or the Cori and Edison era when we were down around the 12 to 15 million. And that's because Perlmutter, while it's a more efficient system, it's using 100% 100% liquid cooling. And so it hits the, the, the cooling towers harder and we're evaporating a lot of water. Um, the preliminary uh, analysis numbers for NURSE 10, on the other hand, has that water use ballooning to around 180 million. So we are in the process of really, really seriously looking at our water usage effectiveness, and we're starting to evaluate new technologies for the NURSE 10 era that will use a lot less water. Um, water usage effectiveness is uh, a different type of a metric. It's not unit lists like the other two. We, we look at the amount of water and the cooling plant energy and you end up with the liters per kilowatt hour. Uh, we have been uh, monitoring that metric for a little bit over a year now. And this is sites specific so you really can't compare one site to another and we're in the process right now of determining for our current cooling plant with Perlmutter what is our efficiency point and we will be developing energy efficiency um, measures and improvements on that. Any questions on this? By the way, um, don't, don't feel uh, shy about just interjecting with questions. Uh, I, I actually prefer to have uh, more of a conversational approach to, to these topics. Um, uh, how do we, I mentioned that in the third budget a bullet, uh, how do we pay attention to how the systems operate? Well, we have deployed this system we call Omni. This is an old, um, flow chart of, uh, of everything that's happening. It's actually not very current no more, but uh, it's still illustrative of how detailed 
uh, it is. Uh, out of all of the hyperscale um, DOE data centers, we have the most high resolution instrumentation system where we are operating on an ethic where we, uh, most of the time and most of the other facilities and historically, uh, when a new project is occurring or when we know that there's a deficient area of, of performance in a data center, a project plan is put together, uh, a data, um, 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 you know, a, a data monitoring plan is put in, the, the systems are deployed, there's a period of gathering data, then we decide what to do, and then a project is designed, and then, you know, the work is done, and then post work, we look at the data again and see how well we've improved things. Well, that's a lot of time delays. And in the period when you're gathering the data, you've got inefficient operation and wasted energy. We operate in a different ethic where we say, we don't know what we need to measure. And that time delay of once we notice we need to uh, get more eyes on the performance of that equipment, it's too late. So we have decided that we have the, the, the capability of just gathering everything. And when we see that we have a problem, we will have that data already. We can go into implementing corrections and adjustments immediately. And thus the Omni was born. And, and so that's what we have. We ha and we keep the, the performance data indefinitely. Um, we, we use the Omni system and data that we have becomes this triumvirate of, of support for our, our, our optimization of the entire facility with the Sustainable Berkeley Lab. That's the, the LBL directorate that, that helps uh, leverage their resources to help us improve NERSC and it's this uh, a positive collaboration which is rapidly becoming uh, a template for uh, for energy efficiency improvements in the entire DOE indeed the the um, the hyper uh, scale scientific community in large one example that of an area that's becoming emerging in all of the large uh, top 50 type data centers is this area of operational data analytics. Um, our Omni pl platform does this, is, is that it commingles HPC telemetry and HVAC infrastructure uh, monitor data into a common uh, data base that we can then analyze together, time synchronize, and be able to deploy solutions. Uh, this, this is a very, very powerful uh, tool. Um, this tool right here, SkySpark, allows us to look at, uh, at all of our, uh, it, it basically has Cray fan, blower fan performance data from, from Corey in this same platform along with the HVAC. And it allows us to look at we establish a bait baseline. This is showing a scatter plot that's showing the cooling plant performance in both a baseline period and a targeted um, uh, analysis period. So what we have here is this baseline fan power and pumping power uh, scatters are, are showing what where we should be performing. We've done settings changes in, in this example, we've done settings changes, and we're looking at that analysis period versus the baseline. And this plot is showing that, um, that we are actually um, burning uh, a lot more energy here in the, in the cooling tower fans. And so this helps us zero in on, on uh, the settings that are in, in the cooling plant. Um, and we can do this real time and we can so, iterate and dial things in. Yes. See, so I, I noticed on, I think it was just this past weekend, um, this uh, being used in, in real life, in fact, and, and probably non concomitant with more detail. But so we had a power outage over the weekend uh, for yep. power maintenance work. Uh, and so when, 
when that happens, when we don't have kind of the main feed of power, uh, we can actually keep a, a fair bit of stuff running on backup power, but Cori computes uh, are just sort of too much for it. In fact, Cori yes. generally is, is is pretty challenging. So we had so so Cori was unavailable, but a whole lot of other things were available. So so you might have noticed, like people here might have noticed that you know you could still use things like the, the DTNs to move data around. Yep. Uh, and so I was watching the internal Slack channel a little bit because. Uh, the you know, the one time that people were a little bit concerned about was during the yeah you know, the middle of Saturday afternoon when the temperature was forecast to mm -hmm. kind of be at the peak and and the big question was you know, we we think if the forecast is right that um, we have enough cooling capacity that can be driven by the backup generator to keep the thing you know, to to keep those things running and and cooled. And there was a you know, a bit of chatter during that time, um, you know, on the internal Slack channel as the operators were watching what I imagine was these charts that Norm's showing right now, and Damn, watching yeah. also the yeah you know, the temperature in individual aisles go, you know, up and down, and and discussing, you know, at which was, point do we need to start doing yeah, more with cooling? Yeah, this is the chart. Mm. This is the chart exactly, and I happen to have it up here. These are the environmentals in the racks that you're talking about. And this is what we were chattering about. These um, are deployed sensors that show us uh, the air intake temperatures. As a matter of fact, we're going to go the last seven days and uh, we can show everyone the outage. Uh, that was over the weekend, right? So, so this period, right? Yeah, these, these were the temperatures right in this period here, where we um, were just operating on that one air handler and we were talking about these, these temperatures as uh, we were down to just the, the, the two backup air handlers. And we were able to make sure that, that this common area um, air-cooled equipment was uh, operating correctly. That's exactly right. And this is the Omni system that was still operating during the power outage. Exactly. Yeah, so that meant that instead of shutting stuff, like instead of shutting everything down for the weekend, we could basically keep a lot of stuff running. And, That's right. Yeah, without, without endangering stuff. Right. So, so again, and, this turned out to be quite useful. Yes. Exactly right. Yeah, that's that's an example. And that this this Grafana here is an example of one of the ODA tools that that we use. And uh, for example, I think we got this one right here. This is uh, this is where I can view the actual performance of all of my air handlers. And uh, this one shows me uh, here's the uh, cooling distribution units for Perlmutter, I'm able to see the inlet water temperature and the outlet water temperature. So we have a whole host of instrumentation that allows us to, to, to watch the, the performance of these uh, systems. And this is one of the other ones. So getting back to the slide deck, um, I mentioned that, that, that we have the capability of HVAC, high resolution telemetry, as well as HPC high resolution telemetry. And I've got one example that I'm gonna work through that, that, that you might be interested in. This is Cori, uh, an XC40 uh, Cray system. And it's part of the, the Cascade system. This is something that users may not have known about Cori. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a combination, it's a hybrid system. It uses cooling water for 70 to 80% of the heat extraction from the processors. And then the balance of that at 20 to 30% is from air that is blown through all of the compute cabinets in a cascade fashion. And the way this works is the, this is why if you've ever been in the room with Corey, <laughs> a lot of people like to use earplugs. It's a honking, noisy machine. <laughs> These blowers are, they're not gentle with what they do. So uh, there's six blower fans in here that, that range from 25 to 4,000 RPM, and they are ear splitting loud when they're at 4,000 RPM. There's six of them. 
springs in the air, goes into the first uh, compute cabinet and through the blades. And uh, there are some heat sinks that extract heat. And then there's a cooling coil here that extracts, like I say, 7 to 80, depending on the cooling water temperature of that heat into the cooling water loop, uh, bringing the air temperature roughly back to the same as the air and through that next cabinet. Uh, repeat, uh, another blower fan to bring velocity back up, rinse, repeat all the way down through the um, something like 15 cabinets till it exhausts out into the room. Well, we um, interacted with Cray way back uh, during the Edison phase to, uh, to tell them that, hey, these fans consume a lot of energy. And it was a significant portion of, of uh, Edison's at the time, uh, uh, total energy consumption, roughly 12%. And for uh, Corey, it was somewhere in the range of 350, almost 400 kilowatts of Corey's energy use, which is uh, somewhere um, in the, it, at that time was three uh, 2.75 uh, kW uh, megawatts. But, uh, but anyways, um, they only gave us three fan speeds in Edison, uh, idle, um, uh, just um, um, I nominally called it, and maximum. And so it was basically uh, 2,500, 3,200, and then 4,000. And uh, we interacted with and said, There's, you gotta have some way of sensing how uh, the, the fans are needed or not so that we can turn them down and save some energy. And they came up with this dynamic fan speed control feature where it would monitor the processor temperatures in the row. And if there is a one hotspot node in the row with a, with a processor that is running um, hotter than the rest, and for every five degree C processor temperature up, change up, it would modulate up the blower fans by 150 RPM up until it got to the uh, 4K maximum. This way, it allowed a, uh, some, some power responsiveness demand on these blowers up and down. That was great. It provided us roughly 7% energy savings just out of the box. But because we're compressionless and our water temperature uh, kind of fluctuates with the outside air temperature, what we call wet bulb that uh, dictates how the cooling towers, how cold water the cooling towers can make. We found that the static cooling coil exiting air temperature, basically the, the servo control loop that says, okay, this cabinet air temperature should be 22 degrees C. If that's a static um, set point, if that cooling water temperature got too high, there would be points where that um, it couldn't make set point. So the cooling water valve would just open up totally and we'd start wasting pumping energy in the cooling plant. So we um, decided to develop uh, an active script on Cori that um, uh, we call dynamic uh, setpoint.py and it's a system management workstation script which looks at the cooling water temperature and uh, actively adjusts that uh, cabinet cooling temperature set point to uh, make sure that we are not just widely opening, opening up that valve in order to try and chase an unobtainable cabinet uh, air temperature. And this is an example of how we are co-mingling uh, the onboard uh, telemetry, uh, that being the actual cabinet air temperature and the cooling, uh, the cabinet air temperature set point. We're feeding that back from the plants um, uh, cooling water temperature and adjusting accordingly. And this way we were, have been able to get uh, a much more agile seasonal performance of the dynamic fan speed control uh, feature in, in Cori. And we're shaving off these points here. These represent a uh, cooling water pump energy. And these are really, really big cooling water pumps. They're 125 horsepower each. 
And so when uh, we're circulating all this water uh, with those uh, cooling water pumps, if we can, you know, knock those uh, cooling water pump uh, speeds down by a couple uh, percentage points, uh, it translates into some, some energy. Uh, savings. Um, in a small way, this is actually a representation of what we can expect to be doing more of in the exascale world, uh, because um, as uh, these HPC systems get even larger, uh, the cooling uh, demands, indeed the uh, power delivery, delivery demands from uh, jobs starting up in these huge exascale systems are probably going to uh, uh, demand even more interactive communication between the cooling plants, the power system deliveries, and the HPC system uh, with an, uh, an exascale system that starts up a job, say that's going to use 75% of the system, and it may all of a sudden in the blink of an eye demand uh, five megawatts more of power. And indeed that translates into cooling demand uh, right away. A cooling plant can't respond to that instantaneously. It is gonna need some sort of pre-learning where you know the job scheduler says, okay, cooling plant, get ready in 10 minutes we're going to need five megawatts worth of cooling capability. And this in a small way kind of represents the future world we're moving towards for um, power responsive cooling plants. Uh, just in closing, a couple words on what the building inf infrastructure group does for energy efficiency um, uh, in the future. For Perlmutter and now Nurse 10, we uh, interact heavily with the design teams in making sure that we incorporate energy efficiency concepts in the actual design right down to the owner's project requirements, uh, as well as all of the, the uh, review during construction and commissioning, as well as engaging with equipment vendors where we see uh, where some new technologies uh, that might be coming from, from manufacturers, uh, might be four or five years out that we could benefit from. I mentioned earlier in the talk that Nurse 10 uh, could potentially raise our water evaporation up to 180 million gallons a year, which actually exceeds the capacity of the pumps feeding Lawrence Berkeley lab. So we have to find alternatives. We started engaging with uh, 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 what we call dry coolers. These are just basically huge automotive radiators is what they are. They're, they're big fans that, that blow through uh, uh, radiator arrays. Uh, to help cool down a closed loop, which then goes into the cooling plant. And they take more surface area, but they don't evaporate water. And so we're engaging with, with uh, those manufacturers to see if we can use that technology for Nurse 10 to help with our water evaporation. Other nurse activities that are in planning, uh, we are looking at uh, machine learning, uh, uh, methods to help us optimize our settings, uh, especially with the, the, the balance uh, between uh, the feed of the cooling tower fans, our most energy intensive uh, component in our cooling systems versus the pumps, uh, which are a little bit more efficient. Uh, right now, we are kind of hitting the fans more and um, the settings between the two are difficult to do manually. They're kind of seasonal. They need to be set one way for one cooling uh, seas, cooling or heating season versus the other. And, and um, it's difficult to find uh, an algorithm that is fully uh, agile between all of the different types of conditions. So we're in the process of uh, uh, planning the, uh, the data that we need in order to deploy some 
machine learning models that that will be much more agile in in, in that regard um, hp also has some products that we're evaluating and we regularly do outreach and collaboration with the with the the various centers around the world like i said earlier the top 50 centers uh, and help them um, and we exchange ideas they help us and and um and we try and stay on the cutting edge of everything. And then closing, uh, I just want to always like to uh, put the word out for everybody that's on the team. And for this summer, we also have two uh, summer students, uh, uh, engine, uh, basically engineer in students, uh, uh, Gabriel Riley and uh, uh, Nicholas Ventura, who are, are both helping us in various corners as well so uh with that i uh, at this time i'm going to put you guys on the spot for some questions that's really interesting thanks tom so a, a couple of uh questions and comments that that uh, your presentation brought to mind uh, mm -hmm. so i thought that was really interesting that you found almost like a, a law of unintended consequences there where adjusting the fan speed to improve the efficiency of Corey kind of had this, like it- Interactive it triggered, Yeah, it triggered an interaction with the cooling system that, that then kind of undid the good that the fan speed was doing. And so by sort of coupling the information together, basically you were able to, you get them to cooperate instead of um, stepping on each other's work. Yeah, it, it, um, it's like we had these, offsetting savings so we got savings in quarry but then we when we looked at it holistically with the second order effects that might be elsewhere and this is very common in building science energy efficiency all the time there are inter second order and third order interactive effects um, we it, it looked like they were roughly uh, roughly offsetting um, now this is a unique situation in our facility and, and every facility is a prototype. We, we are also site specific. A lot of the other Cray XC deployments uh, and, and, and other centers, they will have chillers, meaning their chilled water loop has a set point and the, the air conditioning equipment makes sure that that set point tightly stays within a tight window. So they wouldn't have had this issue because that chiller is just going to be using whatever energy it takes to maintain that cooling water temperature. So in that situation, the dynamic fan speed control out of the box with, uh, with the Cray XE system actually works very, very good. But in a situation where that cooling water temperature diverges a lot uh, due to the outside conditions, that static set point, cabinet air temperature set point does get into a, a situation. This was a very agile solution. And uh, the, the, the CSG group here uh, uh, worked, I, I gotta send all sorts of thanks to them and, the, and Owen, Owen James in the uh, uh, OTG group who de developed the initial Python script and, and then several people and Aditi Gaur is now the expert in the CSG group that, uh, that, that helps with it. And um, uh, uh, I actually presented this way back at NUG Extreme at um, Supercomputing uh, 19, I think it was. Yeah, was it in Denver? Can't remember. Or it was in Dallas. Yeah, That's right. In Dallas. Oh. In Dallas. And um, uh, um, presented it as you know this could potentially be a, a feature improvement. And um, I don't. Cray didn't opt not to go that route, but that's because very shortly thereafter pretty much everything, they, all of their capabilities were focused in on Shasta. Uh, but um, yeah, that that is not uncommon in energy efficiency. Second order and third order effects can often offset your 
first order savings that you thought you were going to be getting. Yep. So it's, it's never quite that simple. So the, the other thing that you reminded me, and and either uh, Norm or possibly somebody else on as is is on as well, uh, can can clarify. So for for NERSC users, uh, the S account command um, has a output option where you can get consumed energy. And for completed jobs, it shows a value. And I think that's getting the energy from, from somewhere in the Omni system. Do you know if that's correct? Yeah. Can you show it to me? And I'll stop share and you show me that. And I so. should be able to tell you. I am relatively confident that's going to be the SEDC, which is the onboard telemetry of the um, COE operating system. Yes, you're right now. Yeah, right, Sridhar. I figured, so, I was hoping you would speak up. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think it uses the gray cap MC or something like that. Which yeah. Is yeah, but, but, you know, nominally speaking, yes, it 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 is the Omni system that extracts that and then likely serves it up to the nurse community, user community. That's exactly correct. Um, just looking for an example of it. That uh, um, so while you're looking for that, uh, that they. Basically for our power numbers, we've got several flavors of them. I, I don't think my slide deck actually says that. We've got, we've got master meters, which we call ion meters um, that, that we use uh, for the campus uses for our total uh, power consumed. They are revenue grade and highly accurate and they're at the substation level. And then uh, the uh, SEDC meters that, that look at Corey alone are, um, uh, there are some onboard power sensing meters that, that go through the SEDC channel and into Omni. And then we have some, and I believe those use Modbus protocol, which we use to pull those into uh, to Corey, they're not are into Omni. They're not revenue grade, but they're very highly accurate. And for Perlmutter, um, we deployed mu meters, uh, which are are called uh, their trend point uh, interval meters, highly accurate, just just tiny bit less accurate than the ion revenue grades. Uh, very, very high resolution, so much so that uh, we decided to submit our um, uh, top 500 uh, as a level three because of the high level of sampling rate that, that it used. I see that we're getting, we're probably out of time. Ooh, it's we might be uh, pushing time, you're right. Um, yeah, so for, um, for people interested in seeing energy use via S account, um, S account dash E, lowercase e, shows you the list of fields that it can display, and the fields are called uh, consumed energy and consumed energy raw. Yeah. yeah, yeah really one control. thing I just want to make it a point like, if you want to do an in depth analysis or use that, that number may not always be accurate. So it's okay to just get a rough uh, estimate of what you are using. But um, if you need more information, I think you can get in touch with us and one of us will be able to help you get exactly. job usage uh, yeah. values um, yeah, in a, with, with more certainty. Yeah, yeah. Either Sri Dude or I can help you with that. And in fact, we, we helped another NERSC user uh, who is a graduate student at UC Berkeley uh, recently in that regard. The, the number does not capture all of the uh, line losses and stuff. Those are SEDC numbers. They're onboard numbers from Corey. Right. 
so, so there's a, a degree of approximation, but but for a first um, first approximation, you can get yes. a sense yeah. of how your yeah. job's performing from an energy perspective. So um, we are at the. Oh, sorry. Steve, I, I I will um I will uh, give I'll, I'll point you to where a PDF is of this uh, deck, just in case anyone wants it. Okay. Sounds great, and we'll um we'll post that on the website uh fairly soon. So we are at the top of the hour, and people probably need to uh, head to the next thing. Um, we'll just very quickly rush through the next couple of items. Uh, so coming up, um, uh, ERCAP season is coming up. So we'll probably uh, aim to have uh, a topic of the day around ERCAP, perhaps for the August um, webinar. We're always interested in topic suggestions and requests, and uh, especially if uh, participants would like to show off their work, uh, let us know. Last month's numbers, uh, we didn't have a the regular scheduled maintenance in June. Uh, we had a, a couple of uh, brief, uh, I think not even complete outages, but uh, system degraded events. Uh, utilization has been sitting fairly steadily up in the kind of 94-ish, 95%. Um, about a third of the jobs that we saw in Cori were using more than 1,024 nodes. And our uh, ticket incoming and outgoing rate is uh, yeah, sitting, sitting kind of reasonably steady. Thank you all, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month.